Okay, so unfortunately, we've been seeing a particular type of patient in our ECG, in our A and E, quite often. All right, so I decided to revisit the topic, and also because we've been doing uh, resuscitation for the last month, so I thought everybody would like to see a familiar type of ECG before we <laughs> uh, jump into other things. All right, so uh, okay, but how many of you did get a chance to look at the ECG yesterday? You saw it? Okay. Didn't, oh, you, want, you didn't hadn't joined the group yet, so you wouldn't know. Yeah. So it's no problem. Did you guys have a chance? Okay. It's not the end of the world. It's fine. All right. So we're going to go through it. Uh, guys on Zoom, I don't know if you had a chance to have a look at it, but it's not. It's actually not the first time that we're seeing this uh, ECG. I think this is about the third time I'm covering this ECG for the simple reason that it's uh, one that we see quite often. All right. So um, what we have here is a 43-year-old man with severe palpitations, all right? So before we even get into the ECG, you are sitting in your car or you just walked in for the handover round or it's late at night and somebody junior to you calls you, all right, into your emergency department and they tell you, listen, we've got a 43-year-old with palpitations, all right? So what's the first thing that comes to mind? Bloody hell, palpitations. Who comes to a hospital for palpitation? Go home, take some Valium and sleep away, isn't it? No, I'm joking. But I mean, let's be honest, right? The guy's seriously having palpitations. What, what are the things that you consider? What are your differential diagnosis? Even before you see the patient, decide to do an ECG, all of that, what would you think of? Anxiety, very good. Panic disorders. You know, you start thinking of all those types, psychiatric type disorders and things like that, right? So then what happens is you, as soon as you walk in, those are the normal common ones that you start thinking of, okay? Uh, and then you look at the monitor and the monitor says the heart rate of 175. Are you still thinking of panic disorder? You can't, isn't it? Why? There's a reason. At 140, would you still consider panic disorder? Yeah, you would. You would. At 149, would you still consider panic disorder? Yes. At 150, would you consider panic disorder? No. So why is 150 a such an, why would I say 150 is an important number? Because generally up to 150, you have a lot of causes of a tachycardia and palpitation, fever, hypovolemia, panic attacks, even cardiac causes, things like that, right? But once you go beyond 150, then you're looking at pathological tachycardias, supraventricular tachycardias, ventricular tachycardias. To start the, you start looking at all of these more cardiac related causes. Okay, so just remember that number 150. Below 150, you could still say, okay, this is a panic attack, it could be something going on. You'll still do your ECG. I mean, you're not going to throw your ECG away, but you're still going to look for those. But if, like in this patient, where you've got a heart rate of yeah, just above 150, actually just below 150, sorry. All right, but, <laughs> but you would do an ECG for all of them. Okay, so anyway, now we've decided. Now let's have a look at the actual ECG, all right, and see what we pick out from it. So anyway, we walked in and we saw there's a high heart rate, okay. So we decided, okay, we are going to do an ECG and we are going to see what's going on. So the first thing that comes is this ECG. So are we still considering panic disorder? No, because it's obviously not a normal ECG, all right? Panic disorders, yes, their hearts will be fast, but they'll have a normal, they'll have a normal sinus ECG. They'll have a normal, normal ECG. So this is a completely abnormal ECG. Come in, come in. Uh, all right, you're looking. Oh, thanks, you brought us muffins and coffee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Can you just come pull up a uh, seat next to us over here? No, this can't be for me. I'm just joking. Please take your break. Please take your breakfast. I don't want to eat it. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right. So what we're going to do first is that we're going to analyze this uh, ECG like we analyze every ECG. All right. So how do we analyze every ECG? We look at axis, rhythm, rate, and then is it raining? No. Okay. Sounded like that. Sorry. Okay, and then we analyze each zone. So let's look at the axis, all right. So uh, anybody want to give me a guess as to what the axis is? This is lead one, and this is lead AVF. All right, now this, was an this is an interesting one. So let's have a look and see. So lead one, is it positive or negative? Or mainly positive or mainly negative? Mainly positive, but 
can almost biphasic, all right? But yeah, okay, let's say for the sake of, of time, all right, it's mainly positive, all right? So that means electricity is moving towards lead one, all right? And then lead F is, AVF, sorry, is negative, all right? So let's draw it out, okay, just so that we know where it is. Now, uh, if you are lost, you don't know what's going on, then please go back and have a look at our whole thing. Our, we've got a got a whole video on the axis, all right? So these are the quadrants, all right? So normal axis, left axis, extreme right, and right. Can you see from there? Okay, no problem. So we've got lead one here, all right? Then we've got lead AVF here. So what we are saying was, sorry, trying to, okay. So what we said was lead one, all right? Uh, there's lead one. It's seeing electricity coming towards it, all right? So in other words, you can't have your axis here, all right? can never be there, it can never be there. So we've got either a left axis or a normal axis. And then lead AVF is negative. So that means electricity is moving away from it. So this is the most likely place where electricity is going to be, all right? Now in this case, it is a bit of an interesting one because even though electricity is moving towards lead one, it's actually kind of biphasic, all right? biphasic, right? If you look at lead one, it's biphasic. So what that means is that for a time, electricity is moving towards it. So it sees it as positive, then electricity is moving away from it. So it's seeing it as negative. So in actually, the, what that means is your actual axis, you have to work it out, is there. Somewhere just about there. All right, just, just for interest sake, I'm just showing you, all right? So it's quite a bad uh, left axis deviation, all right, that this patient has, okay. Uh, all right, so anyway, we've got that. So let's go to the rhythm. So the rhythm, the first thing that we look at is the atrium, is the atrium functioning. So in this case, the atrium is the P waves. Can we see any P waves? Nothing. So for, is this a normal a tachycardia or an abnormal tachycardia? Not the diagnosis, normal or abnormal? No abnormal tachycardia, right? Because we cannot see P waves, all right? So we can't talk about uh, QRS after every P. We can't talk about PR distance. We can't talk about anything. Yes, the only thing we can talk about is the QRS complexes themselves. So are they narrow or wide? People on Zoom, you are very quiet. Eh? All right, so yeah, you are correct. It looks wide, isn't it? It's actually, it's not very narrow. It starts off narrow and then it gets a little bit wide. Agreed. So we've got these wide QRS complexes and are they regular or irregular? Irregular, regular, isn't it? In fact, very regular. Okay, absolutely regular, which is abnormal. I mean, we're supposed to have some arrhythmia. Every time, even now, if you feel your pulse, breathe in, your heart goes slightly faster, breathe out. Okay, so if we had to take, that means this patient is only breathing in. It's impossible, all right? So what that means is that the heart is just at a heavy tachycardia, all right? But we know it's not a normal tachycardia, it's an abnormal. Don't worry, Kanil, we'll get to the answer. I can see you sitting over there like, hey, what's going on? All right, let's work out the rate, okay? So the rate we, well, now your machines work it out for you, but this one here is just about 150, all right? Slightly below 150, it's about 148, 149. So it's one of those, all right? So you would have still considered panic disorders, but you have done an ECG after that, okay? So we've got a tachycardia. We know it's not a sinus tachycardia because we don't have a P wave, all right? So what are the other tachycardias that we know? So let's try and figure out what type of a tachycardia this may be. So what other tachycardias do you know? Sinus. Sinus, but in order to have a sinus tachycardia, it means a tachycardia with P waves, all right? So we can already take that out. Any other tachycardias that we know? Any other tachycardias? Sorry? Sorry, I've got one ear open for your guys. You just have to talk a bit louder. Hey? Ventricular. ventricular tachycardia, very good. Another one? Sounds almost like ventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia. Anything else that you can think of? 
Okay, then you have things like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, but you hear what I'm saying, atrium, 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 there's nothing here with the atrium, right? So let's go back to the other two then, all right? So supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia, all right? So one of the things that we said is that when the atrium is not giving you any sort of input to your ventricle, your ventricle generally gives you a wide QRS complex, all right? So, and when your atrium is involved, in other words, your SA node is speaking to your AV node, then you generally have a narrow complex complex ventricle, all right? That's the thing. So what do we have in this one, narrow or wide? Because narrow is narrow, all right? Narrow is narrow. So look at the start of it, right till the end of it. it is, is it narrow or wide? I mean, if you had to see this on another ECG, would you say it's narrow or wide? If it starts from here and finishes there, it's why it isn't doesn't matter whether part of the morphology looks good or part of the morphology looks bad like this one here too i mean look at that the part of the morphology looks normal part of, part of the so but you never call it normal because you've got two normal looking parts put together isn't it doesn't mean you've got two normal ears in the middle of your face your face is normal agreed so it's an abnormal thing all right so if you you were to say ventricular tachycardia on this particular one nobody would shout at you it's a good it's a good decision, okay? Now, there's a few things that later on when you learn, you understand why it's not a ventricular tachycardia, but that's a very good uh, guess as to what it may be. So what are you going to do with this patient now once you got that? We'll get into that in a little while, all right? Now, we start looking at other things. Like, for example, we look at each zone. So we look at the inferior zone, two, three, AVF. We start looking at whether we can pick out abnormalities. But what we start to notice is that the override, overriding abnormality is this tachycardia that's over there. It makes it very difficult for us to pick out other abnormalities. So especially when it comes to things like ischemias, you're looking at QT intervals, you're looking at all of these other things, it suddenly becomes very difficult because you've got this tachycardia that's overriding everything. So what you've got to do is get rid of the tachycardia to be able to see what's the underlying cause for the heart problems. In other words, you can't really pick out a lot until you sort out the tachycardia. This patient could have atrial fib, could have atrial flutter. This patient could have an underlying ischemia, could have underlying hyperkalemia. There's a lot of things that are going on, but until you actually sort out the uh, tachycardia, there's not much that you're going to pick out, all right? But if you were to go through the zones, you would look at two, three, and AVF as your inferior zones. You'd look at V1 and V2 as your septum. Now, what does what is this um, pattern called? It's a pattern we should all know. M pattern. Uh, what looks like an M in V1 and V2? Yeah, you're, you're correct. But what does it uh, show us? You know, so V1 and V2 sit here. All right. Which part of the heart is in the front center of the chest? right ventricle, all right? So V1 and V2 are looking quite a bit at the right ventricle and the septum, all right? So what's happening here? What do you see happening? Electricity is coming, going, coming again, coming again. So what does it tell you about the pathway? So imagine the right ventricle is us walking. Imagine all of us trying to walk into casualty from the ambulance bay, all right? And as soon as we come here to these doors, they are blocked. So we've got to go back and find another way to come around. So what's happening in the right ventricle? It's got a block, or what we call in medicine, a right bundle branch block. Okay, got it. So when you see this M-type pattern, then it's a right bundle branch block, because all it means is electricity is coming to the ventricle, something is blocking, it's going back and trying to get back again. All right. So there's two types, incomplete and complete. All right. Complete is wide. Okay more than four small blocks. Incomplete is like less than four blocks. So this is a complete. That's the only way to tell the difference. Complete heart block, white. I mean, complete right bundle branch block. Incomplete, narrow, less than four. Okay, but that's just something that we found. If we look at V3. So this is also continuing to give that picture of a right bundle branch block, but V3 and V4, the anterior parts of the heart. V5, V6 are the lateral parts of the heart and leads one and AVL are the high lateral leads, all right? So what have we decided for this patient? This is a ventricular tachycardia, all right? With right bundle branch block, okay? We happy? Not happy? 
Good. All right. Shouldn't be happy because it doesn't look like a typical ventricular tachycardia. Right? But if you were to come to me, for example, and call me in the middle of the night and say, you know what, I've got a ventricular tachycardia, I wouldn't shout at you. Okay. I wouldn't shout at you because I understand how you reach that conclusion. All right. Now let's go to the actual one. I like using this one because it gets everybody thinking about both. Now, in this case, we have a supraventricular tachycardia. Now we're going to get to what's going on, all right? Why it's uh, actually an SVT and not a right, uh, not a VT, all right? So we've got a supraventricular tachycardia, but a relatively slow one of 135. Right? We say 140, but they worked it out to 135 with a right bundle branch block, all right? So that's the important part. Okay, so there is a bundle branch block. So what happens when there's a bundle branch block? Can electricity move normally through the heart? No. So even though everything's working properly, as soon as it hits this doorway where that's blocked or this pathway that's blocked, it's got to find alternate routes for, you know, disseminating its electricity. So what does that do to the QRS complex? It widens it. All right. So let's go back to this over here. So if you were to look at the first half of this QRS complex, it's very narrow. All right. And then when it hits the block, it becomes wide. Okay, so this is actually a narrow, complex tachycardia, but it looks wide. Okay, now this is a very odd thing. It's called, uh, what you might call it, supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. Aberrancy means that even before the tachycardia, you had some sort of bundle branch block. Okay, now don't stress about that. Like I say, if you tell somebody this is a ventricular tachycardia, you're not know, going to fight with you. The important thing is that you picked up it's a tachycardia, you picked up something is wrong. Okay, but I just wanted to show it to you, just to show you that don't, you know, sometimes things can be weird. All right. The only reason the rate is low, below 150, is because of this right bundle branch block, because it's taking longer for electricity to go everywhere. You know, we're talking about milliseconds. Not even seconds, you know, milliseconds, all right? So 0, 0, 0,00 something, 0, 0,00 something, you know, things like that, all right? It's very hard to distinguish from atrial flutter 2.1, but anyway, we're not talking about atrial flutters today. So it's a wide complex, regular tachycardia without evidence of P waves, all right? So we should immediately consider ventricular tachycardia, which is what we did. And we said, and that's no problem if we did it, all right? However, the treating physician was quickly able to contain, see, I had to get a previous ECG, all right, which demonstrated sinus rhythm with a pre-existing right bundle branch block. So that was why they were able to get it, all right? So QRS morphologies were identical between the two ECGs, therefore the diagnosis of SVT was made, all right? Now, the question is not whether it was an SVT or a VT. The question was, did you diagnose a tachycardia? Did you diagnose a pathological tachycardia? And yes, you did. You didn't just continue to say this is a uh, panic attack. All right, or something like that. This is a genuine tachycardia. There is something going wrong and we need to treat the patient, all right? Now, this is something I wanted to discuss because I haven't discussed with you guys a lot before is adenosine, all right? So we're gonna get into that just now. So let's have a look at some of the tachycardias that we get. So this is more typical of a ventricular tachycardia, all right? So it's a wide complex tachycardia, all right? So the way I like to think of it is dragon's teeth or vampire's teeth. All right, so that's what it looks like. All right, so if you remember that that's what uh, it looks like, then you'll never get lost. Okay, that's ventricular tachycardia. And if it doesn't look like this, chances are it's some one of the other tachycardias. Okay, even if you can't put your finger on it. Okay, but it's one of the others. Then a sinus tachycardia has a fast sinus rhythm. You can see the P waves there, all right? Even though or the, sometimes you get a, a, a hidden P wave or a P wave just behind, there's a lot of different ones. I'm not going to get into it right now. And then supraventricular tachycardia, supra, superior, above the ventricle, all right? Where there's no P waves, narrow complex, and very regular. Okay. So the most important thing is to identify that it's a pathological tachycardia. All right. Now, what can you do about it? That depends on how much you remember. So if you remember a lot about it and you know how to treat it, great. But if you can't, all of a sudden you're panicking and you don't know what to do, then what are you going to do? You're going to call somebody senior. All right. That's the important thing. Now, for the two of you are going to be commissars sitting in the middle of Norway next year, and you're going to get a patient like this. All right. And they are going to come. So you need to know how you can treat it. So how do you think we treat these tachycardias? Let's say right now, you ended up in Amersfoort. 
today, tomorrow, they told you, congratulations, we think you did enough as an intern, go to Amersfoort. And tonight you're on call and there you get a, an SVT walking in. What are you going to do? Uh, hey? Rest. <laughs> First day, you're right. <laughs> okay, let's say they're on call tomorrow. Right? <laughs> That's a good ride. That's a good. <laughs> so let's say today you rest. Okay. Thank you. Tomorrow you go to work and you get an SVT. What are you going to do? Because you're phoning, you're phoning the MO on call. He put his phone off and he went to sleep. All right. So what are you going to do now? It's your first night as a comster. You get stuck with an SVT. You know it's an SVT very well. You diagnosed it, all right? But what do you do about it? Otherwise, you're like a dog that's chasing a car. And now the car stops and you came by and you're like, shit, I don't know what to do now. You know, I never thought I'd get this far. You know what I mean? I actually got the car now, but what do I do, all right? So it's important to know not just diagnosis, but the importance of treatment. So how do you think you treat an SVT? An SVT? All right. So it's important to know because these are very common tachycardia. All right. So anybody. Even those on Zoom, anybody got an idea of how we would treat it? What would be the first thing that you would try? First thing that you would try is vagal maneuvers. All right. So what are vagal maneuvers? Any idea? You would put ice on the head. All right. Uh, you would ask the patient to do a valsalva maneuver, which is blow against resistance. You have something called the revert maneuver, which is very specific for SVT. And we've covered it before. I've got a whole video on one of the previous SVT ones. Okay. So those are the first things that you can try and do. Any sort of vagal maneuver. All right. So some of the vagal maneuvers they describe that don't actually work are rubbing the eyes and things like that. Those don't actually work. All right. So the best thing is to put something cold on the head. In other words, you want to shock the heart back into normal without actually physically shocking it. All right. So the other thing, like I say, the patient to sit up and blow into a syringe, for example, and try and get them to move the plunger out. But the revert maneuver is Better. but even that as a Valsalva maneuver can generally help, right? The other things you can try is ask the patient to uh, hunch down and hold their breath and then quickly stand up, right? But there you risk, run the risk of uh, syncope falling and then getting hurt, but it's actually quite effective, but that's why we do the revert maneuver. It's a lot more, uh, what you call it. Uh, the, well, anyway, if you have a chance, just go and watch it, all right? So the revert maneuver, things like that. So those things are not working. Anything else that you think you can use? Have you ever heard of carotid massage? Okay. So carotid massage, what happens is that you have the carotid barrel receptor that runs here, right? Now I'm not going to press it too hard. Just now I'll get up ready. But anyway, so what's supposed to happen is that you turn the patient, like for, so we, we rub the carotids hard for about 15 to 25 seconds, right? The problem with this is, sorry, we don't know if the patient has any sort of uh, thrombus in the carotids. So especially in elderly patients, you have to be a bit careful. So in other words, before you start doing this, listen, all right? If you are 100% sure, 100% sure that there's no blockages, there's no turbulence, there's no bruise, there's nothing, then you go ahead and massage. So the way that you do it is you turn the patient's head away from the side that you want to rub. So for example, I'm rubbing the right-hand side, so the patient's looking to the left. I place my hand over the carotid and I give it a firm, all right? Um, give me your hand, all right? So it's not a... I'm giving a rub. Sorry if I bruised you. All right. But it's a rub. You get what I mean? You're rubbing on that carotid very hard, right? So your carotid barrel receptor gets stimulated. Okay. Now, the actual pathophysiology behind is quite interesting. We have a chance to go and read it. I'm not going to explain the whole thing now. It's another lecture on its own. So what happens is you do that for 15 to 20 seconds, turn the patient to the other side, do it for another 15 to 20 seconds, do that about two times, monitor the patient, see what's going on. It does work. Especially if you've got a young patient, healthy patient, no evidence of any sort of atherosclerosis, things like that. But as soon as you get an elderly patient, don't even think about it. Because even if you can't hear something, chances are you'll kill them. All right? Because they'll just shoot off an embolus to the brain and die. Okay. So if it's a young patient, you can try it, but it's kind of fallen out of favor. All right. Okay. So all of that doesn't work. That's when you go to the, oh, okay. We'll get to the treatment just now. I just wanted to show you guys because I didn't really have a chance before. So in other words, what, why do we get supraventricular tachycardias like this? Right? So this is a more typical example of a sinus tachycardia. Right? So you can see the P waves and things like that. And a supraventricular tachycardia, no P waves. 
narrow complexes and extremely regular. It doesn't go up and down with the breathing. All right? So what normally happens is the SA node sends a signal to the AV node that then reconducts everything along. All right? And then there's also a conduction towards the left atrium. Okay. Now what happens in a supraventricular tachycardia is that you have what they call accessory pathways. In other words, there are pieces of tissue that conduct electricity be besides your normal electrical conduction tissue besides these, all right? So what happens is these patients who have this, instead of it following the normal pathway, it will now jump to that accessory pathway, all right? So it acts almost like a, a circuit. So what happens is the electricity comes here and before it has, the SA node has a chance to fire again, it, it immediately tells the AV node, go, 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 go. So the SA node also sits back and chills out. It's still, it's still functioning, but it's not needed. So it's carrying on, it's pretending like nothing's happening. Trust me, it knows what's happening, but it just pretends like nothing's happening. And it's letting this take over the entire function, right? The only problem with this is because of physical distance and because of how electricity travels, again, very interesting pathophysiology going to get into it. Basically, it keeps on hitting the AV node over and over and over and over and over and keeps on telling, come on, go, 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 go. And the AV node is a masochist, all right? You know about those people who like to be tied up and whooped? That is the AV node. No matter, just so long as somebody is telling it what to do, the AV node will do it. It does not care who it is. It will just go, yes, no problem. All right. Yes, master. That's what it does. All right. And when it doesn't have anybody, it sits there crying and tries to do its work, but it doesn't really want to. All right. So this is what it's, is happening. This AV, AV node is pummeled by all of these accessory pathways, and it just keeps on firing, 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 firing. But because it is getting its stimulation from higher up, in other words, it's not telling itself to go fast. Something else is telling it to go fast. That is why you have narrow complexes. If it's telling itself to go fast, oh, sorry, such as here, it becomes very wide because it's now telling itself, I need to go fast, okay? For whatever reason, then it becomes a wide complex, okay? All right, so you can see that's how it works. Now, re-entry pathways and accessory pathways, there's a textbook about that thick about them, all right? So that's why I say the pathophysics is very interesting, but I don't want to shuffle your brains right now, okay? So anyway, now we're going to get into the treatment just a little bit, okay? So we've got all of these patients that we've tried, uh, what you might call it, uh, there we go. So we've tried vagal maneuvers, all of that, and we haven't been able to stabilize the patient. That's when we start getting to uh, medications and things like that. Now, synchronized cardioversion, I'm not going to cover in this one because we've talked about it before many, many times, all right? So if you guys are not sure, you can't remember, go back, there's many of these SVT videos where, or SVT uh, talks, we've talked about synchronized cardioversion, how it works and things like that. The one that I wanted to take a bit of time on today was adenosine, all right? Little bit of time on adenosine. And even though it's said that we should use it, why we so rarely use it, all right? Now, the, the thing I was going to tell you guys, all right, is that like, for instance, now you guys are going to be comserves next year. So I want you guys to remember this. You've done your vagal maneuvers, you've done everything. The patient is still not responding. Please do not ask for adenosine. I will show you why. Even though it's in the, what you call in the algorithm, even those of you who are listening, do not run for adenosine. You will see on the next slide why not. Right? The first thing that you run for is actually amiodarone. All right. First thing you run for is amiodarone. Depending on the size of the patient, very large, very small, you either give 150 or 300 milligrams. If you forget that, do not worry. You can always Google it. Even Amersfoort has signal. Don't worry. So you Google, all right? So it will tell you 150, 300. You put that in a bag of fluid and let it run over 10 minutes, okay? That should normally settle down. It will settle down 99% of your tachy, your, your, your SVTs will settle down with that, all right? Then if you're still stuck, then you have to go and shock the patient, all right? But not gonna talk about shocking, shocking now, we're just gonna talk about these two, all right? So amiodarone, all right? Well, here we've got 300, 300 milligrams is exactly how it's supposed to be given, all right? Over about 10 minutes. What amiodarone does, amiodarone slows the conduction between the QRS complex and your T wave, all right? So in other words, it slows the time from contraction to relaxation. So what's happening during a tachycardia is this, there's no time to relax and properly inflate. So what it does is by changing some of the way the channels actually work, your sodium, potassium channels, calcium channels, things like that. So I say there's big, big books about all of these things, right? So when you have that, what it does is it slowly moves them apart. 
So you start having a differentiation between your QRS complex and your T wave. They start moving apart. And as they start moving apart, the conduction happens slower, 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 and eventually everything just kind of settles down. All right. Now, adenosine on the other way works in a different way. Adenosine goes into the heart, it goes to the vagal nerve, and it shuts it down. All right. So it goes there, and it just very simply tells the vagal nerve, shut up. So it stops. And when the vagal nerve stops, the heart stops. It's the same as when you cardiovert. So it goes there, stops the heart in the hope that when it restarts, it will restart properly. The problem with the denosine is it's broken down extremely quickly, like within milliseconds. As soon as plasma hits it, it's degraded. The reason being a denosine is a normal, uh, what you call it, uh, chemical found within our system. Otherwise, you'd be your heart would be stopping every second. You know what I mean? You'd be going into asystole because there's adenosine everywhere. So adenosine is broken up very rapidly within plasma, right? It's meant to exist within cells, nuclei, mitochondria, things like that, but it's not even meant to exist in plasma, right? It can exist in the red blood cell, but not outside of that, right? Now, some have been uh, talking about giving it as a 20 mole mix. And uh, I want to show you why adenosine is so difficult to give. This is how you are supposed to give adenosine. Now, this is actually how you give uh, what you might call it, the contrast for an angiogram. But it's exactly the same principle. You need to be able to trap the adenosine between your fluids. So in other words, you've got, for example, ringer's lactate of 5% glucose here. You've got ringer's lactate of 5% glucose there. You're supposed to be able to push your adenosine and you're supposed to be able to block it again with plasma or what I mean with fluid, all right? So in other words, you are supposed to be able to get all of this ready within a few minutes. You must have adenosine ready. You must be able to remember how exactly you're going to turn everything. It's called the four thumbs method and all of that. By the time you even Google this, <laughs> you remember what it's called. You watch the video because even, the, even if you watch the videos on YouTube, look at the terror in the presenter's eyes. All right. I promise you, as they look at this method and they're smiling and they're trying to explain to you what's going on, but look in their eyes. In their eyes, you can see that terror that they are wondering, am I doing this correctly? Because it's so bloody confusing. All right. Did I push the right one at the right time with the right amount of pressure to make sure the adenosine doesn't fly back? Is the adenosine going to be caught? Is the adenosine? But ideally, what's supposed to happen? As it enters your vein, you get a block of Linger's lactate, for example. Then you get your adenosine and another block of ringer's lactate. So in other words, the ringer's lactate is supposed to act like a, a bodyguard and take it through to the heart. So what happens is that if you don't get that combination right of ringers, adenosine ringers, your adenosine is of no use. Okay. Now let's say by some miracle you get it right. Okay. Not, even in the ACLS course, when you go, they never get it right. You'll see even the instructors like, oh, shit. Oh, no, no. You have to, yeah, yeah. No, this is theoretically how, you know, they, they do that because even they get lost. So we've kind of moved away from it now, but it does work. If you get it right, that the adenosine will hit the vagal nerve. And as you are watching this SVT, your patient will suddenly flatline. They're going to asystole, all right? Then if you get it right, your, your temptation will be to go and start CPR. No, what actually happens is the same as cardioversion. It stops, and then eventually it starts beating in a normal rhythm again, all right? And you can try six milligrams, and if that doesn't work, you can try 12 milligrams. But like I told you, you got to set up all of this in the meantime, all right? Now, like I said, this is not adenosine. It's just to give you an example of how complicated it can be, all right? So... Don't run for adenosine in real life situations, okay? Rather, what you call, go for amiodarone or go to shock the patient, right, if they are unstable. But that was what I wanted to concentrate on today. So that's, uh, I just want to go through one more thing. So in this patient that we had, he only had palpitations, all right? Nothing else. He wasn't unstable. There was nothing wrong with him. So if the patient is stable, that is where we'll first try our vagal maneuvers. We'll consider adenosine and then say no, but we will consider amiodarone and say yes. And once we start giving the amiodarone, normally what happens is the blood, uh, the heart rate goes 160, 140. Next thing you see, it's 130, 120. You start seeing atrial flutters. You start seeing what's the underlying cause of this. You start Start seeing everything all right so that's how we treat that that patient first and if the patient is unstable now how do we determine instability lots of ways you look for chest pain signs of heart failure uh, you look for decreased level of consciousness hypotension you can look for all of those the only thing you must really look for is the bp blood pressure 
because the reason that the rest of them are happening is because of the blood pressure. The patient will have ischemic chest pain because of low blood pressure. The patient's level of consciousness will decrease because of low blood pressure. The patient will be going to heart failure because of ischemia because of low blood pressure. Right. So in other words, your patient is unstable tachycardia or bradycardia if they are hypotensive. All right. So if they are hypotensive, don't spend time rubbing their carotids and slapping them with ice packs and rubbing their eyes and pulling their nose. They're not going to respond to that. You can start with amiodarone if they borderline and see if they don't, if they improve. But if they are unstable, the immediate thing that you go for is cardioversion, right? And if you haven't seen synchronized cardioversion, like you say, look at the previous one that we had, I've got it on there, all right? And uh, I'll see, I'll, I'll look for the video, but I, I know we had done it, I think about two months ago, we did SVTs. So you'll find it on that, all right? So that's basically that for today. Okay, that's just a joke to finish up. Huh? So any questions, anything you want to know? I hope you guys, I think you all had a look at it yesterday, you could see. Did you all get the right answer? Close, it's very difficult to distinguish from a flutter, actually. That's the thing. So you did well. If even if you said it was HL flutter, nobody would say no. Anybody else had a look at it? It's okay if you didn't. No, I decided to start it. That's good. No, that's fine. The most important thing is that you start. So I said whenever we do ECGs, I'll, I'll release it the night before so people have a chance to go through it, right? So that you get an idea of you know how these things work. Okay. So if there are any questions? Anything I want to know? I know I have a habit of just talking and talking and talking and not listening. People on Zoom, any questions? Or were you guys okay? Hope you could hear me through the whole thing. Uh, okay. Well, nobody's left, so that's good. Okay. No problem. <laughs> okay. All right. So if there's no questions, or if you think of questions, they can always message me. All right. Jairo, I know I can see you sitting over there like, ah, you didn't learn anything in medical school and they sent me here. Don't worry, those links I gave you, go watch the older meeting, start from the basics and then eventually all of this becomes easy as well. All, right? all of these guys all sat through the basics. They've been learning with me for what now, a year and something. And you can see they still look at it and go, oh, I don't know what's going on. All right. So don't stress. All right. The more important thing is to know normal from abnormal. But you first have to learn normal and then you start learning these abnormalities. Okay. All right. So we'll finish it there. And then we'll take it for, we'll see you guys next week. Okay, on Thursday. Sorry, right, Thursday.